Hello and welcome to episode 8 of the Physique Development Podcast. Today's episode is our newly structured rapid Q&A. If you guys listened to episode 7, that was also a rapid Q&A. This is where we take your questions and quickly answer them with the need to knows on the topic based on our education and experience with working with clients. As always, it is our goal not only to supply you, the listener, with valuable insights on the topics or questions, but also just to plant some seeds for further research and thought. So without further ado, we will get right into today's rapid Q&A. What's up, guys? So the first question that we have is going to be, how many steps should you take if working a desk job? And then if you're still working that just desk job and your goal is fat loss. So this is a multifaceted question here where the first thing is, is just asking how many steps should you take when uh, working a desk job? And that would come off of how many steps are you getting currently? So where I would start with a client is going to be assessing how many steps you're getting on a day to day basis, just organically Just start tracking, don't change anything just as we would within a nutritional uh, three day recall or something of that nature to assess where someone's caloric intake is, you would do the same thing with the steps from there. Let's say that organically, I work a desk job, I well, I walk down to my office for, in our in our home. So okay. it's about less than 50 steps tops. Um, and then from there, I'm just kind of walking around up into the kitchen, everything like that. So maybe I'm getting like 3000 steps on a, on a good day, if I'm not making a point of it. From there, I would just try to add a 1000 steps. And then once I got good at 4000, I'd go to 5000. I think that oftentimes individuals hear 10,000 steps and, and they're they're headstrong and getting that 10,000 steps done. And it's that could be a huge you know, shock to you where you could be in the same boat as myself, where two to 3000 steps is kind of your norm. For you to jump up to 10,001 is going to be time consuming to you in that general sense. But uh, also, you're going to be potentially fatigued from simply walking and you're going to feel overwhelmingly soft because you're like, wow, I, I walked more and my I feel like I got my ass kicked. Um, so to avoid that, titrating it up will be beneficial. And then in terms of fat loss, this is going to undulate. I can't give you a specific number to this. Of course, it is going to be a greater activity level, um, but there's no concrete number of like, if you get this many steps, you are going to be in a caloric deficit and you're going to lose all the body fat in the world. It is going to be, a, again, a titration and it is going to work in conjunction with the prescribed cardio that you may have post-training or uh, obviously with your nutrition and training and, and all the other components. Yeah. And uh, one quick note there is that 10K is arbitrary. There's no data that shows magically that 10K is the absolute epitome of health. Like Alex said, it's going to vary depending on what your lifestyle is like. 10K was something that was established and was something that was easy to remember. It's harder to remember like oh, 5.5K steps or whatever it may be. Um, so 10K steps was something that was estab established and like caught on and it's very easy to remember, but it's not the end all be all of health. So do not feel bad if you get less than 10K steps. Uh, Alex Austin and I get less than 10K steps most days. Um, and like Alex said, my ass was absolutely beat when I was out walking like 15, 20K steps in a day. I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? I feel awful. So keep that in mind as well. Um, so going into the next question, it was, do you notice more challenges or with body image when you are leaner. I'm wondering if there's science behind it or if it's just me. So I have definitely seen this trend myself. Um, there's a few reasons I would personally say this happens. So one, as you're dieting and getting leaner, you're normally more on top of variables and you spend a, lo a lot of time thinking or worrying about your body. So since you're more zoned in and thinking about the changes that should be happening, it can lead to having worse body image or more awareness of your body image because you're consumed by your image. So if you're in a deficit or if you're in a contest prep, you're on top of everything. So you understand the inputs and what the output should be. So it's easier to be like zoned in on your body image when that's the case. Because when I'm not in a deficit, I'm not 
hyper analyzing every second of my body. I'm not looking at my body and thinking about what changes should be there because I know that it's going to be less changes on a day-to-day basis. So the other thing there is since you're working towards a look rather than a feel when you're dieting, um, it can have you hyper analyze yourself. So it's also something that because you can't decide where you lose weight, you might be perceiving flaws more as your body loses fat. So if you're like, all I want is to see abs, or all I want is to do X, Y, and Z. Again, you're going for a look, not a feel. And so you can be more consumed within your body image um, because you're not seeing things drop exactly where you want to. So I think that it's definitely a thing for having worse body image as you diet or as you get leaner because you're more aware of how your body is changing. You're seeing that fat drop off um, and it's very easy to analyze yourself constantly. Yeah. And I, I'll speak off an, ex, an experience standpoint because Sue covered that really well. So, um, and I know anyone who's like di- dieted down or competed in the past or anything like that, uh, you're going to notice when you are like dialing in for a show, for example, or dialing in for like a photo shoot or just getting lean, um, you absolutely feel like you're not lean enough. I, I remember my last show, I look back at photos and I'm like, I look back at photos now and I'm like, dude, you were lean. And I was like the leanest I've ever been. Um, but I remember that t- like two weeks out, peak week, I was just like, dude, I'm not lean enough. This is this isn't going to work. I'm not going to do well. And um, and doing well is relative because like I did well for me. Um, doing well as far as placings go, I didn't do well. But as far as what I wanted to accomplish, I did great. Um, and I was definitely lean enough. I was the leanest I've ever been. I was the fullest I've ever been. I was the perfect combination of of all those things in my eyes. But leading up to that day, I was like, I am not lean enough. Um, And I almost like pulled out of the prep, to be honest, because I just didn't feel like I was there. I didn't have the look that I I wanted to have. And man, this is why having accountability, this is why having a second eye is so huge in in regards to uh, having a coach or having someone there to kind of be that that second look, um, that second eye, because you're going to make... You don't want to be the one with the final call, that final judgment call based off of your own perceptions, um, because you're probably going to have some weird perception and sort of identity or, or feeling about the way you look, and you're probably going to be pretty wrong. Um, <clears throat> so it definitely it definitely helps to have some accountability there. But I, I think this is absolutely a part of that journey. Um, there's definitely psychology to this. I've definitely heard terms put on this. I cannot remember them, um, so I won't try to make them up. But all in all, uh, this is definitely a thing, and I think we've all dealt with it. So moving on to the next one, weighing food, cooked or raw. So I'm going to speak again off of something I I always say, and I'll hand it off to these guys. So whatever you're going to do, do it consistently. So if you're, it's better to be consistently wrong than periodically wrong, right? So if, cause we're making adjustments based off of what we're doing day to day, right? So if we're making adjustments based off like incredible consistency. Um, so I personally have never weighed my food raw ever. Like I just have never, I, I don't, I think it honestly grossed me out to like put the raw meat on something to weigh it out when I first started to weigh food and I was just like, I'm not doing this. And so I have forever weighed all my food cooked. And I think the biggest thing is to be sure that not only you're consistent with this, but also understand um, that when you're going to track these foods that you should track them, try to find them in like your tracking app, like my fitness pal as cooked, right? So don't be sure that it isn't, you're not tracking a raw weight or a raw sort of measurement in the app and you're weighing it cooked and there, there is going to be sort of a discrepancy there. Um, but whatever you're doing, do it consistently is, is my take. And I'll hand it off to these guys for sure. That's basically it. Mackenzie is going to have a video um, and we'll have it on the YouTube going over conversions when it comes to like dry versus cooked weight. But if you are interested, you can always do the conversion once and then cook it the same way and have that conversion as you move forward. Why don't you tell them 
like how to do the conversion. Like don't just leave it at conversion. (laughs) So when it comes to the conversion, if you, let's say you buy a pound of chicken and you weigh it and it is 16 ounces of chicken. And then let's say you grill it and then it comes back and it's 14 or 13 ounces of chicken, what you would do is divide that 13 by that 16. And then that would be the conversion over. So for example, uh, when I was in prep my very first time, I used to cook everything per that meal raw because I once read that raw was the most accurate. And it probably is the most accurate. But like Austin said, it's based off of consistency and what you're going to track as that. So uh, before from there, I started to weigh all of my stuff raw, I would cook it and then weigh it cooked and then do the conversion over. Um, And now I have those conversions and I just cook my food the same way. So for example, chicken for Alex and I um, is about 0.7 of its weight. So one pound is actually 0.7 pounds. um, Once you've cooked it, And that's the conversion we use as we move forward. So that's just a a quick recap on like what it would look like for a conversion. So it's the same thing with like rice. When you look at rice and you have dry rice, 100 grams of dry rice versus 100 grams of cooked rice is completely different amounts of carbs. So definitely make sure you're tracking those correctly. Uh, But being able to say, okay, I'm taking 150 grams of rice, I'm cooking it, then I'm going to weigh it afterwards, then dividing that and being able to see okay, this much of cooked rice is this much of dry rice. So being able to have those is going to be extremely helpful if you're confused, uh, but you can always wait, put it in as cooked, just like Austin said, making sure it says like grilled chicken breast cooked or whatever it may be, or chicken breast cooked or rice cooked um, to be able to have that. Yeah. And with rice, it's, it's another one like peanut butter where it's going to be a little depressing to see how little <laughs> of rice comparatively uh, from a carb perspective. But nevertheless, let's get into the next one. Uh, do you recommend gluten or dairy free diets to your clients and why? So the simplistic answer to this is certainly if they have a gluten or dairy intolerance, that would be a very easy reason why we would do that. Um, Another reason would be to potentially eliminate some things if they are experiencing any digestive issues. Those are two things that we can very quickly remove out of the diet to see if those are problematic for the individual. Um, If we are doing some form of elimination diet, uh, that would be two things that we could potentially remove to see if uh, their digestive issues... um, go away or anything like that. So that would be the the main times that we would remove that. I I don't believe that any three of us would just immediately say no gluten, no dairy. Um, Those are things that we could potentially move out in the later stages of a prep just to keep our variables very, very concrete. But uh, those would be the main scenarios. Yeah, mostly just digestion for me. So or for my clients, not for me personally. (laughs) But going into the next question here. So in a fat loss phase and want to travel for a week, should I follow my program or stop? So this is a great question. It's going to depend on your goals a little bit, but I'll give a few different scenarios here. So let's say that you are going on a vacation vacation, like you are going to the beach or wherever it may go, you may be going. I think that's a great time to be able to have a deload in place. And I think that going into a deep dive on a a future episode on deloads would be extremely beneficial. uh, So we can give the, the full full picture because there's a lot to dive into within a deload. But with a deload, it would be a great time to make sure your parasympathetic nervous system is dominant. So on a vacation, normally it's no work. Being able to take that time away from tracking and away from the gym could be extremely beneficial. It's not something that you want to grind 24-7 and never take time off. You always, always, always are going to need time off of things. And so um, it could be a really great time to make sure that your programming lines up to be able to take a week off, whether you pause your training and get back to it when you come back or being able to have have it set up where you end a training phase, then you have the deload and maybe start a new training phase when you get back. Now, let's say that you travel a lot. Maybe it's something that you kind of have to decide when you're going to take that break. So for example, Alex and I recently traveled for three plus weeks. We are not going to take three plus weeks off of training because it was something where it wasn't really vacation. We were traveling for work. And so we still got our training sessions in where we needed to. And we've talked about in other episodes uh, about how we travel and train and make sure we keep that uh, so we can 
do our training and how we go about scouting out gyms and making sure we have everything. Uh, but when it's a vacation, or let's say you're going to visit family and you don't want to take that time away from family, we talked about this in that prior podcast episode as well, where it was see how you can have movement and incorporate movement with your family without taking that time away. So for me, whenever I go and visit family, we're going on walks and I try to minimize the amount of time that I'm either at the gym or the amount of days I have to go to the gym if I do choose to go to the gym while I'm there. But it's completely fine to take a week off of training. Um, And Alex and I are actually going on vacation here soon. And we plan on just moving our bodies as we feel. If we don't get any training in, I'm completely okay with that. If we train four times, I'm completely okay with that. But we are just talking. I can't wait to just go on a walk on the beach, be able to train if I want to, but it's not something where I'm putting this insane amount of pressure on myself that absolutely everything has to be perfect. And to go in tandem with this, if you're also wondering what you should do with food, it's the same scenario. Sometimes it's really great to take that week off of tracking, but you can also go a few different ways. So you could have a protein goal for yourself. So whether that is, okay, I'm going to hit 130 grams of protein each day, or I'm going to make sure I have four feedings of protein um, each each day. So you're having four meals uh, or making sure that each meal has protein in it. So you're not just snacking throughout the whole time. Uh, or you could go again the whole time without tracking at all and just being intuitive, being mindful about your goals and what that looks like. So especially if you're in a fat loss phase, if you have a coach discussing it with that coach, but also looking at the timeline in which you need things done. So if you are like, oh, I got to look a certain way by this certain time, then maybe there is going to be a little bit more as far as structure structure going into that trip. But if you're like, oh, this is just a great time for me to take a week off and then be excited about the diet when I return, then that is completely fine as well. Awesome. Next question. How important is meal timing on weekdays versus weekends and while you're out on the weekends? So I'll repeat that because that was horribly, horribly said. How important is meal timing on weekdays versus weekends while you're out? So to kind of just go out on this uh, really simply, it's your body really doesn't have any idea whether what Saturday is Sunday is. Um, we absolutely, I think we absolutely need breaks, um, which is where we kind of get those weekends. But if you understand kind of where the weekend came from in the general timeline of our human evolution here uh, in the recent years, it's it's definitely not for it's not for taking things and just going uh, ad libitum with everything. Um, And this is going to be really dependent on goals. But I will say, um, first and foremost, that I think um, it's not the end of the world if you're slightly off. But it's very important that you try and keep things as consistent as possible. So when keeping sleep times, wake up times relatively the same is typically a really good idea. We're looking at circadian rhythm. So circadian rhythm is the thing that sort of governs a lot within our system. It governs, it it governs, um, metabolism in a large way. It governs, uh, hormones in a large way. It governs a lot of things in a large way. Um, and it can impact, uh, insulin sensitivity and things like that. So I will say that if you can keep things as consistent as you can over the weekend, and that goes with just general meal timing, it doesn't have to be as strict, but I would say try and get it within the same hour if you can. Um, And I would say if you're going to skip a meal, um, like skipping, if you, if you're a breakfast skipper on the weekends, go for it, I guess, if that's kind of within your routine. Um, But I will say that generally keeping things the same is going to help you stay within your structure, stay within that rhythm and allow you to easily kind of progress back into the week after the fact. Um, But again, if you have a coach or you're working towards certain goals, these are going to be things that you can talk through with them. And then obviously it's going to depend on what that weekend looks like. Um, But again, my general advice is to try your best to keep it the same um, or keep it close and kind of work from there. Because I, based off experience and based off working with clients, the more we can kind of keep this generally around the same ballpark, um, you're going to roll into the week 
that much better. You're going to keep your sleep wake up times pretty consistent. And it's not skipping a beat feels really, really good. So if you get out of rhythm on the weekend, you don't have to be crushing it. But like if you get out of rhythm on the weekends and you're off, it is really hard to get back into your game on Monday. I will say that. So if you can just not skip a beat as far as your sleep and your meals go, um, again, generally trying to be close, then I would say that's a good, good place to start at least. Yeah. And just if you need to create a new structure for your weekend, do that as well. A lot of clients just say because they don't have the same structure of, okay, I'm going to work nine to five or whatever that looks like. It's very hard to stay on routine, but realizing the routine can look different as long as you set that routine. So oftentimes clients will fall behind on water or have problems within meals. So just setting up a routine for what that is, even if it's a little bit more flexible, being able to go into the weekend, feeling confident with your skills and not feeling like the weekend was a wash every day time. Don't eat like an asshole. Okay. Next one. Um, best recovery tips. So the individual who asked this, I don't have names here is I think more so asking for some voodoo magic because they say outside of nutrition and sleep and water consumption and rest, it's like, well, those are going to be the majority of what we're looking at. Um, and you can, other things that would be outside of this are going to kind of be in the same ballpark where we are trying to get into the most parasympathetic activity uh, or parasympathetic state as we can. And when Sue had already brought up parasympathetic activity, this is going to be our rest and digest um, within the nervous system. So within that, uh, we want to live there, yoga, uh, some leisurely walks where we can keep our, our heart rate under 100 beats per minute. Uh, so you're going at a pretty leisurely pace. These things are going to help with recovery. Um, while you are within nutrition as well, getting plenty of micronutrients within your, uh, within your veggies and within your um, fruits. And then also within recovery, making sure that your training volume and things of that nature are in an adequate place as well. So if you're just kicking your ass in the gym and, and getting to the next chest training session and still haven't recovered from the session you had five days ago, I would probably look at better structure within your training uh, before even anything else. Um, and also obviously looking at protein consumption, how well you are dispersing those meals, things of that nature are going to be other things outside of just the, the basic, have better nutrition, have better sleep, things of that nature. Yeah, but don't knock those. Those are extremely important. Sleep, water, stress, uh, those are all going to completely determine your, your recovery there. Going into the next question here, can you have fats before training? How before are fats before training okay? So this is something that when I first started getting into fitness, I thought it was like fats were the devil to have before and after training. You were just going to get fat if you had fats before or after training. Uh, and then I learned a little bit um, and realized that that is not the case. So when it comes to fat and training, the reason that most of the time you hear making sure you're getting a protein and a carb source and lower fat before and or after training is when it comes to your digestion. So fats do slow down digestion, fats and fiber slow down digestion. And so if you are eating fats um, and a higher amount of fat before training, then that could mean that the food is still sitting in your stomach while you're training and you want a nearly empty stomach. Now you don't need to go into training starving, but you also don't want to have just eaten and then going into training with a full stomach because when you're training, you are in that fight or flight mode. And when your body is trying to digest food, it needs to be in the rest and digest. Um, so with that, you want to make sure that you're fully done digesting food before you go and train, or it could have you not digest your food properly, have a stomach ache, um, feel heavy throughout your training, um, and then not be able to utilize that food during training as well. So being able to make sure that you're setting yourself up based on how your body body responds to different foods. Now, as far as post-training, there is a little bit of truth in regards to how fat consumption goes towards like your gains and recovery. So it's not that fat makes you fat. You want fat in your diet. Dietary fat is extremely important for home hormonal function. But let's say that you have pretty low fat. Um, let's say it's at like 40, which is like the lowest that well, of course, in contest prep, it might go a little bit lower than that. But 40 is where it's like normal hormonal function. We're in a good spot. But let's say you have 40 grams of fat, and then you have a meal that's 30 grams of fat post workout. 
I would not personally suggest that because your body might be more prone to save fat as fat or to store that as fat. Um, so it comes down to a little bit of how your body digests it as well as how many macros you have of each macro going into a meal. So when I have lower food, I'm not going to put all of my fat around my training. Now, I realize that I personally prefer if my first meal is about three hours out, two and a half to three hours out from training, and it is a little bit higher fat and a little bit higher fiber. Now, I'm not saying, okay, I'm going to have 30 grams of fat and 30 grams of fiber in that meal, but I'm not trying to have zero fat and zero fiber in that meal. So it's a little bit of trial and error of how you're your body responds, and then being able to realize the processes of this food and why it says that. Uh, protein, you want it in place for being able to recover. You want carbs in place because it's going to be the fastest form of energy. So for fats, it's a little bit wonky because it's going to depend on the person, the amount of fats that they have. And then it's also going to be something that it's easier just to say protein and carbs instead of trying to give this huge caveat to how you should structure fats. Um, one thing I'll add anecdotally for me is that within like training legs, especially when I'm at the body fat level that I'm at now, I promise you, I have enough glucose, uh, going through the bloodstream at this very moment that I don't <laughs> need carbs pre-workout. God is my witness. Uh, you can look at my fasted physique photos to tell you that now when I'm in contest prep and I am significantly leaner at that point, carbs are going to be a little bit more necessary. But when I'm training legs, uh, especially in an improvement season, such as I'm in, um, I'd like to have just protein and fats for the most part. I don't have a ton of carbs in that pre-workout meal because honestly, when I'm training legs, I'm absolutely burying myself from an intensity perspective. Thus, if I'm to have carbs, I just kind of feel a little bit, uh, sluggish. I feel the greater likelihood hood um, of being sick. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is how I go about things personally. Yeah. And I think I've, I've kind of identifying and kind of meeting in the middle there is a great point as well. And having a mixed meal is not bad either. Um, so having a, you know, moderate protein, moderate carb, moderate fat meal is not a bad idea either. So just making sure it does fit within those daily allowances and understanding that a mixed meal may not be the worst option for you. Um, and don't just don't think that you have to have like protein carb or protein fat. Um, not that these other guys were saying that, but as far as like, don't get in that headspace of like, oh, it's one or the other because you can have a mixed meal that is more than okay. Just to give you some actionable things here for the person asking, normally we say if you're going to have a full meal, to have it um, two to three hours before training, to have at least um, 25 grams of protein, but you can go up to 50 depending on your digestion and depending on your protein goals. For carbs, we normally say 25 to 50% of your carbs pre and post training. And then for fats, it's anywhere from five to 15% of your fat. So again, what's going off of how much you have available to you, instead of just hard and fast numbers. So for carbs, if I am in a contest prep, if I'm very lean, all of my carbs are around my training. If I have 100 carbs, it's 50 pre 50 post and other meals are just protein and fat. So again, it depends on what situation you're in. But those are some guidelines for you to be able to use. So an hour to three hours, hours before training. And then you want to get a meal in within two hours of training post training. And then it's going to be those similar guidelines as well. All right. Is there ever a time where you wouldn't use a deload? So first thing that comes to mind here is there definitely are times where I wouldn't necessarily use a deload. Um, in, in large part, that would be like someone who's newer to training or, coming off a long layover period and they've really kind of started out things pretty slowly um, as far as like training volume goes, training intensity, um, overall frequency and stuff like that. So I definitely don't think you always have to have a deload like every on the fifth week of every phase. I don't think you have to have a deload after every four weeks of training. Um, <clears throat> there definitely is a time and a place for deloads. And again, we'll go over that and, and more of a deep dive in a future episode. Um, and there is also an article on our website talking about how to get back into training after a long layoff. And I do kind of go into deloads in that article. It's on physiquedevelopment.com backslash whatever that article is called. Um, how to get back or I don't know how to get back into training after a long layover, I think is what it's called. But 
nonetheless, um, there definitely are times where I wouldn't necessarily schedule in a deload for a client. It's going to have a lot to do with biofeedback. It's going to have a lot to do with how they're progressing, how they're feeling. Are they keeping motivation going into the gym? Um, do they continuously feel like they want to go to the gym more or less is what I mean by that. Um, are their training, is their training performance still improving? Are they still getting stronger? Are they still getting good pumps? All these things are definitely a tell. Um, you can always err on the side of caution. Deloads aren't the enemy um, in any situation. So if you feel as if like, ah, oh, I'm not sure of like, should I push another week or maybe take a deload? If you're considering it, a deload's never the worst idea. Um, but just know that you don't have to take one like on the fifth week of every phase is what I'll say. Cool. Yeah. I mean, the, the only other time really would be uh, it, potentially in a contest prep where things are getting late in the game. Uh, and with, with the way that physique development programs, we deload from other stimuli by using different forms of stimulus. And we can dig significantly deeper into that at a later date. But um, that would be how we would work through that. But it wouldn't necessarily be like on paper. This is a deload, if you will, like in the you know three weeks out or something like that from a show. Okay, the next thing is that the question of not having my cycle or the loss of my cycle, does it hinder my ability to uh, grow muscle? And so with this, this is something that we can do another deep dive in because this is a much longer topic than just a, a rapid fire uh, answer. But I will say that this is a uh, sign from the body that hormonally things are in an optimal position, that your uh, body is is uh, functioning well. So I would I would reckon that it is going to hinder um, muscle growth, but it is also going to be a protective mechanism when the body is no longer allowing for that cycle to transpire because something is off. So you are um, in, in a position that things need to be fixed. I would much prefer in an improvement season for an athlete to have their cycle in a healthy position and, and have it monthly. Thus, that is with many of our physique development clients who are listening right now, as we really drive home in their improvement season to if they lost it during their psych or during their, um, during their prep, then at that point we are working uh, diligently following that show to uh, regain the cycle so that we can be in the most optimal position possible to gain muscle. Yeah. If you function optimally, you're going to have a better time gaining muscle. So being able to have that in place is definitely not going to hurt. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, yeah, and, and speaking from like some straight logic, if you think about it, if your body is not in a position to have a cycle regularly, growing muscle is not something that's extremely easy for your body to do. There's a lot of checks and balances your body has to go through for it to be in a position to say, hey, you know what? We have some extra resources here. Let's sit down, build this out. Let's paint the walls. Let's add a, let's add a patio on the back. Let's, let's add some tissue to our biceps. And so if you're not in a position where you're having your normal cycle due to whatever that is, low calories, stress, uh, everything else under the sun that could impact that, um, then you're probably going to hinder some muscle growth opportunities there. So definitely think about correcting that or getting with someone or professional, you can help you, um, sort of reinstate that, um, or get that back going and then be in a better position and be patient with getting that back. Yeah. And we, we are speaking on optimal terms. Can you build muscle without having your cycle? Sure. I'm sure there is a degree of muscle growth that can transpire over time. Certainly that, but are, we're speaking in the most optimal terms and, and the three of us believe that it would be in your best interest, whomever asked to, to have your cycle uh, regularly. Yeah. And I'll just say one thing on that is I lost my cycle during my prep and I just recently got it back. And so I think that I will have much better muscle growth moving forward. I think that I have had muscle growth in this off season so far, but I think that it is going to be leaps and bounds better now that everything is in equilibrium. So there are a few more questions here, but some of them I think would be so great for a deep dive. So to wrap it up, I'm going to do actual rapid fire right now. And these guys don't even know it. So they're caught off guard. It's rapid fire. So, um, what is your favorite board game? Catan. Catan. Hmm. Board game. Yeah. Hmm. I don't even know the last time I played a board game, to be honest with you. Um, well, we're going to have to learn you up on Catan. <laughs> learn Catan me up. Fun. Uh, shit. I don't know, man. 
I would say a card game. I, I'd say I'd go cards probably over a board game. Um, I'm I'm pro board game, but it's been a long <laughs> time since I played a board game. I'll I'll quickly say shoots and ladders. I'll probably say Monopoly or Catan. So we'll go ahead and do our favorite card game then. I'll say hand and foot or phase ten. Minus phase ten. Phase ten's dope. And then I like um I like like Jen and, and stuff like that. Um that's fun to play. I play a lot of that progressive rummy, big into progressive rummy. Um mainly because I can just understand it. There's so many card games <laughs> that I'm just oblivious. Like I really, really question my own intelligence when it comes to card games. Like people are <laughs> explaining it to me and I'm like, you could be speaking Chinese at this point. I have no idea what you're trying to tell me. So. so I should not teach you hand and foot. If you're listening and you've played hand and foot, you basically need a slide rule to remember all of the rules. And you have a lot of cards in your hand. So I definitely know Austin couldn't play because phase 10, you have 10 cards in your hand. And it looked like Austin probably at 20 the way he was holding it. Um, I so. struggle immensely <laughs> with having too many cards in my hand. I don't know where that comes from, but it's some sort of uh, maybe from like, I don't know. I'm not even going to say it. I don't even know where that comes from, to be honest with you. <laughs> okay. If you could teach one subject in school, what would it be? Um, I, get, I, I would like to teach math. Math? Yeah. Expand. What about <laughs> math would you want to teach? Um, I find it to be... What type I, of math? Well, I, I felt like it was a cop-out to say anything like science or chemistry related, just because I feel like that's far too easy for us. Um, what type of math? Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like <laughs> some form of like algebra to keep it super duper simple. I don't feel like I would want to treat teach like trig or some shit like that. Like, that would be horrible. Shout out to Melinda Miller here. The, <laughs> the algebra plug. Yeah. Mel yeah. Melinda saved me through trig through all of it. I mean, she was the saving grace to my grades all through high school within all math classes. Austin, what would you teach? <laughs> Mm. You can use I really the like cop the... out of, of uh, anything chemistry or biology related. I, I've, you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'd like to teach anyone stoichiometry or anything like that. I think <laughs> all that can, and can, kindly, can kindly fuck off. But um, chemistry is honestly just a bunch of math. So that's, it's, it's only chemistry is math. So um, it's a lot of memorization and then it's math based off what you memorized, essentially. Uh, there, are, there are people teaching classes that I'd be really um, interested to teach as far as like life goes. Um, and if I could go back to university now, it really, really, I, I think I do better in the sense of being able to like gain a better perspective of like what's important while I'm here. Like not playing the grades game, not playing like all this, the game of the academics, the game of like getting through university. Like what can I do to build connections? What can I do to really take, make the most out of this experience? Um, some class like that. I know, I know like Scott Barry Kaufman teaches a class at, I want to say, I think he's at Columbia, maybe, I don't know. Um, and like Lori Santos teaches a class at Yale based off of um, like the science of happiness and stuff like that. Obviously they're obvious they're qualified to teach those classes. <laughs> I'm in no way qualified to teach those classes. So personal training, I'll go with personal training. <laughs> huge <laughs> After all that personal <laughs> training, he gave this huge philosophy thing goes ah, personal training. <laughs> I think it would be fun to do health to teach people about food. That's always something the two I said. Easiest but things on earth. I said, you said that would math. Be fun. You, even, you didn't even know. You had to come up with but it. But if yeah, I had to true. pick like a normal class, I think about like there's things that I enjoy teaching clients or enjoy teaching in general, but there's other things that I know that I could be good at teaching, but I would just like be so frustrated that people just don't already know that. So I feel like math would be, I loved math in school. I loved calculus. And I think that teaching it would be fun because it's not like in literature or in English where I have to like be on top of, okay, is that the right contraction? Is that right? The right period? Is that the right, like, punctuation um or is that the right interpretation for math it's just is it seven because the answer is seven yes okay everyone did it right i loved the like clarity that math had for calculus anything past that was like this 
is not making sense. So um, anything with arithmetic I could do anything yeah, with arithmetic right. I'm, I'm fine with. It's when you get like beyond arithmetic, you get into like the geometries and the, any ometry. I am, you lost me years before that, um, <laughs> within the abstract. I do think now I'd be better with proofs, mm-hmm. but oh, I hate just it. because I can think better about that. Like in high school, I could not conceptualize anything outside of like a ball was involved. Um, but outside of that, I, I do like math in the, in the sense of like problem solving, huge fan of math for anyone out there that is royally just pissed that they had to take math in college because they're, why do I have to take this? I don't need to know this, blah, blah, blah. You are better for it because you took math. You are better for it because you had to t- have patience and work through problems and do hard shit and deal with it. Like you are better for that. You are better at problem solving. You are better at trying new ways to solve the same problem over and over again. So if you're in that boat and you're pissed, be less pissed because you're better for it. <laughs> Austin be gave pissed. like seven answers there. That was the most fair weather. Hey, like. I'm a ja- <laughs> jack of all trades. Uh, I'll just just hand me whatever you want. I'll, I'll give it a go. No one will learn anything, but I'll get great reviews. <laughs> all right. What's your favorite beverage? Favorite beverage? Big ginger ale fan. <laughs> Um, not expect what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, I didn't. I honestly, I'm just going like, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And then if something doesn't come to mind, I'll literally just talk a circle around it till I get there, which is exactly what I did in the last, in the last <laughs> question. So, um, which is also one of my biggest feedback points of this podcast. So <laughs> kudos to whoever said that. Um, other than that, probably Gatorade. <laughs> like real Gatorade or ze- uh, Gatorade Zero? I want full sugar Gatorade. Yeah, I would. Lo- I mean, uh, I feel like our fridge is is vitamin, the lemonade vitamin oh, waters that lemonade. are are zeros or whatever, and then the Gatorade zeros. Those are the two big things, and then literally just water. I, I feel like this is so so soft of me to answer that, but truthfully, all we drink is going to be water, the Gatorade zeros, and then the lemonades. Yeah. All I drink. Coffee's good too. Oh, yeah. no coffee. shit. Yeah. I was going to uh, say, my number one. coffee, water, and lemonade are the only things I drink, like other than alcoholic drinks. And like all growing up, because a lot of people ask, like, or Alex definitely asked my mom, like, did she drink this much water growing up? Or was it just when she got into fitness? And my mom was like, no, she drank that much water. Like, I would bottom waters at restaurants and like take the waters from my parents, but water and lemonade, my go tos. I thought she was so I will tell the story for her because she's chomping at the bit to tell this is that she doesn't like carbonation. I, she wanted to say that. No, I know I she didn't. did. <laughs> I didn't. She say wanted it, so she I didn't. every time a drink is brought up. She's like, listen, I don't even like carbonation. Oh. OK, like you guys all like carbonation. I don't like carbonation. She Alex, was she wanted to say that. I, watched I did her. not want to say it. Alex thinks that I'm joking. He thinks that we are going to get to like our 10 year wedding anniversary and I'm going to be like jokes on you. I like carbonation. It's true. She's going to drink like a full fledged Mountain Dew and just like shower in it and say, I've been waiting for this moment my entire life. No, I don't like carbonation, but I wasn't going to say it. Um, (laughs) What is one thing that you can't do? There's a lot of things that I can't do. For me, I can't roll my R's. Mm. I I don't know how like in the general sense, like the the electrician we had at the house today. I have no idea what the hell he was doing. I mean, he was crossing wires. And if I had the opportunity to do that, I would have burnt the house down. You also can't drive stick. That's that was thing. that was rude. But yes, I cannot drive stick. That's the thing. Can. I can't hold 10 cards in my hand. <laughs> That's um, damn true. This is true. And I, I think that explains more about me as a person than anything you'll ever know about <laughs> me. So, All right. Last question here. What makes you laugh no matter what? Makes me laugh. I'll say the office. <laughs> cop yeah. out. Yeah, that was such a cop out. What? I um, can't give a truthful <laughs> answer. Or it's a cop oh, out. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I I could cop out and say like the the dogs doing like wiggle butt when they're so excited when when we come in the door or something like that. But I feel like that's also. Or you could say my wife because she's hilarious. I wouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> Look at you laughing right now. I was laughing at myself. And then um, what do you have, Austin? I'll think on mine while you you answer. Uh, Something my wife and I... Fuck me. (laughs) Something my wife and I always say is, you're the funniest person you've ever met. 
And so similar to what Alex just said, like, I think I can make myself laugh pretty quickly. Be- I don't know how it pure out of probably pure stupidity or what's coming out of my mouth. Um, if anyone knows cure your enthusiasm, like understands how Larry David functions in that show. Um, I don't act like Larry David acts in that show. Cause that would be obscene and no one would ever talk to me because if you watch that show, everyone hates Larry David in that show. But that is like my inner dialogue. So if you guys are familiar, I know that's very kind of niche, but if you guys are familiar with Curb Your Enthusiasm and, and the way that <laughs> Larry David projects himself, um, I would say that's my inner dialogue to myself. But I honestly, I don't have a good answer for this. I don't know. I mean, other than TV shows, like um, I would say The Office, Seinfeld, those are two that just like, I would say Kramer usually makes me laugh. I will say outside of the dogs doing the wiggle butt thing, uh, I will say two dear friends of all three of ours, Ray Thornberry, who I know is listening to this podcast, I'm sure. <laughs> really and then Cody Hobbs, both of them, <laughs> really who would be listen. I know they're both listening. So uh, both of them, I can be all three of us could be with them at any point and we would immediately laugh for anything that they would do. So Cody yeah, could easily do stand up and like any time yeah, that he is here. Up. I am like on the floor dying. He is the best storyteller ever. So maybe we should. <laughs> maybe we have him dude. on the podcast. <laughs> maybe we have him on the podcast and he tells some stories for you guys because you guys would shit yourself. <laughs> oh, it would be something else. He, he should actually, the one story he should tell that would be on brand with physique development and fitness would be the summer he spent with Alex trying to do the fitness. Austin was here too. So it was, he sent, he spent a summer at our house, but Austin was also involved yeah, but i'm saying that story would go hilarious. Um, i wasn't involved in like podcast. force feeding his ass eggs and pop tarts i, I was not involved there in for that. The I, I t- yeah i'm just there for the workouts i don't take credit for your nutritional genius um which is well, why he tapped out in the first place that was really just like muscular developments nutritional advice really it was jay cutler's diet i mean to almost a t <laughs> and if you guys don't know they absolutely looked like jay cutler at this age both <laughs> oh of yeah them. yeah Alex would cut out Jay Cutler's diet from the magazine every month. And I would just follow it from like ages 14 to about 17. (laughs) Well, that will be all for the rapid fire Q and a, we will be doing some deep dives on the topics that we talked about today. And then a few other topics as well. I think it's a good job good idea to have a mix of some deeper dives and then having some more fun ones or some shorter ones here. Um, and then we also really want to go over, we got a lot of feedback just saying that they wanted, you guys wanted to hear more about us. And hopefully this last little segment was helpful with that. Um, but we wanted to go over mistakes that we made starting off and just telling some pretty funny stories of us getting into our fitness journey. So definitely keep your ears ready for that. I was about to say keep your eyes peeled, but I guess that works too because you would see us post about it. But that is all for today's episode.